Hey, how's it going? So, if you open up the project folder, if you're even following along, or, you know, with ever whatever project you have, um, if you're using idle as your IDE, then, or if you want to, what you can do is you can right click on a .py file, and uh, if you're using Windows, and go to open with, and then come down to choose default program. And if you come up here, if you look at your um, idle shortcut in your start menu, then you'll find this link right here. We'll copy that. And it's um, going to a particular Python folder, and then it's going into the capital L lib, idle lib, idle.pyw, um, in case you have to look for it on the command line yourself. So we're, we want to do that same thing, but instead of idle pi w, we want to do idle bat, and that allows us to uh, open a file really easily as like for a default handler. So what I did is copy this, but if my memory serves me, I already have it set up. Um, we're gonna have to to navigate it ourselves. So I'll go to open with, choose default program, and I leave that checked, but I select more options and I scroll down and look for another app and this will dump you in your program files folder if you have a 64-bit system you can push the up arrow and you'll also have a, uh, a program file x86 so if your Python's 32-bit it will be in here somewhere if your Python's 64-bit then it will be in this regular program files and if your Python's older um, then it will probably just be like C colon backslash. It'll just be on the regular C drive like that. So anyway, mine's in here in the standard 64-bit program files under Python, um, Python 37. And then if you go into that capital L lib, then idle lib, and then select idle bat. And that's the one you want. And so that will register this um, idle environment as the default handler for .py files if you just double click them in Windows so it's up to you if you want that convenience and then if you have a whole project folder like this like I have this new calc folder I can just highlight all these files and I could hit enter or right click and just hit open and then they'll all pop open in a in an idle window like that and then I can just close this folder alright OPS Okay, and then for each one of these, we can just, um, we can maximize it. So I'll just hit Alt Space X on each one. That way it's just a little bit more consistent and nice to look at. So this was our project. If you've been following along the videos, um, or even if you haven't, your eyes are probably glazing over right now, like a donut. That's cool because that's what happens once we revisit code. That's what mine did when I first opened this up. I looked at these files a few times, but um, they were just completely foreign to me. It had been so long since I looked at them, or almost completely foreign. So anyway, just to kind of reintroduce it, this calc.py is the main entry point. Um, you can also see the name right there. And uh, it imports our input, basically our backend processor and our output. And it just has this one main function that calls and gets input and then it stores that in the inputs and then it calls and uh, to calculate those results to the back end and then it stores that in the result and then it calls the output module to display that result and uh, one thing I noticed when I was going to open these files after I hadn't visited them in a long time was that I was confused between calculator and calc I couldn't remember which one was the main file so I decided you know while we're here, one of those just regular iterations of refactoring is to just go ahead and rename this file. So I'm going to rename it to main.py. And nothing else really depends on this. So save as. And then I'll come up here to, or I'm going to, yeah, calc main.py. So I'll change the name of this file right here to calc main and then I'll control A and control C to copy it and then down here I'll just control V so basically I'm just I rename the file on the disk and then 
I'm going to save as that same file name. So let's effectively dump off the old file name and overwrite the this new one. Okay, so that's cool. And like I said, this one shouldn't have any dependencies on it, so that should be the only place since this is the main entry point of the program. Save that again. This change this was the only other fix I had in here because this input is just kind of whatever. It's um, we'll see. We'll get to that. So then there was the so that pretty much covers it for main. Um, other than when we come back to change that so I'll leave it open for now one thing I also want to mention was that like when we come back in here and look at this if we start asking questions about it we can say like why do we have this main function you know why did we decide to call it all funky like that and of course the reason is not just convention but um, the fact that to sort of isolate the the namespace here because everything outside of a function is going to be in that global namespace and that's dangerous so by instead of having all that code down here we tell it to make this call and that that encapsulates that namespace so we know that we know why there's this because this is complexity you know all that's complexity right there that it would run exactly the same without that or you know at least in our simple situation it would run exactly the same like that but as things got more complicated that could change unintentionally so anyway that was just a simple example of that if we come over here to this test um, there were some problems with this I just tried to tack this on I was getting tired at the end of the last video obviously but I love my mistakes that I'm making because whatever there I, I like to have mistakes because no software project thing goes off without a hitch so it's way more real world so what we got right here is the regular backend test it's just an addition test it is calling this calculator module and these are sort of like objects these are all all these little file names all these files they're all effectively singleton objects as far as you care so it's real nice you get that pretty much for free with Python so don't think that like oh you need to make a class or anything like that I mean in some cases you do but until that need absolute need arises then um, you know keep it simple this saves you all sorts of extra trouble and you know that a lot of this stuff you only want one instance of so anyway so that's testing that if we start looking at it I went through real quick and pasted some notes so I wouldn't forget to mention a few things so hard-coded values not dry um, if we want to test a negative number we'd have to create a whole new addition function and we'd have to put like a negative five in there or whatever we're doing so that doesn't make you know that's not reusable we're rewriting we'd be effectively rewriting all of that code just to change a few numbers so what we'll do is we'll pull those out and have them as parameters and we can just say that's num that's a didn't put good spacing in there that's a this is b oh, okay wait I forgot I put a dictionary in here so should I just take this dictionary out no I'm gonna leave the dictionary in because if I were to change that if I just pass simple primitive values as the parameters then that gives me less reason to change I think because it's just literally a few simple values and if I were to do a dictionary then if I change this to an object say then I would have to change the parameters for the test but if I change it to a an object behind the scenes I can just come in here to this one test change this to an object if need be and go ahead and approach it from that route it's all trade-offs it's all considerations for some reason you might choose the other way but just I say simple and dry are the best choices to make so we'll go ahead and do that so that's gonna pass in an A and a B and a C or we could even I don't know we should be more descriptive than that but 
right now I don't want to hang up on anything I just want to go because the last video was like two hours so this one's not even gonna be 20 minutes okay so that right there gets rid of those hard-coded values but when we call the test we need to pass in values so we come down here to our tests test console input test GUI did we never call the test calculate edition oh it's commented out okay test calculate edition and then we'll pass it 5 8 and a 13 save that so we come up here it's going to pass 5 8 and 13 it's going to make sure that that all pans out and print a dot okay and these so that's a proper unit test for the most part um, these ones aren't at all I don't know what I was thinking but I imagine it's the same kind of thought process like some junior engineers could end up in is that I was trying to do like an input validation test so that wouldn't be a good unit test this test would go inside or as a helper function to the input function to actually you know check the input during runtime um, unit tests don't run during runtime they run instead I mean they basically they run during runtime but not during your main programs runtime they only run during the runtime of the testing runtime so with a bad test you want to do something about it as soon as possible so one thing I could do is comment these out like if these were like almost valid tests and I'd already typed a lot and this sort of like gets me in the frame of mind to where I need to be then it might be better to just disable these tests so that they can be found and fixed and re-enabled or something like that but um, otherwise the best if you're unsure just delete the test there's nothing worse than I mean don't just go deleting tests but if in this case it is a failing test if I hit a five so what is it no module name calc oh this one does why did this depend on calc I don't think that's supposed to be there so I'm gonna try commenting that out a lot of times I'll use comments as like sort of like a deprecation step so right here I'm just commenting it out so that if it breaks something I can just come right back and uncomment it and also so that I can just I'll leave it there even for like a commit if I'm storing to revision control I'll just leave it there and it's just sort of like you can just see things deprecating okay and like I said it's good to come back and be able to just flip that switch so right here now we're getting a little further and you can see the dot so the first test it ran past and then we're getting tracebacks and failed tests so Alt F4 to close that window and if we come down to our actual you know this is just the definition of the tests all right here this is importing dependencies up there and right here is the actual running of the tests which ones we want to run so this first one runs fine down here's where it starts crashing this test console input test GUI input so if we come up here test console input test GUI input like I said these aren't even valid unit tests so I'm just gonna grab them and get them out of there and save that and then I can come down here and get rid of them there and save that and then of course we want to run test it make sure we didn't break anything more than we intended oops what am I doing oh it just ran the one test and passed it and it shouldn't have that's another thing with the uh, unit test is I shouldn't have to be doing input that's not a proper unit test that's like a user acceptance test or just a manual test through a user interface um, but yeah unit tests are supposed to be automatic so that's good I'll run it one more time so you can just see run bink little passing dot done okay what do we have down here so the test calculator make test calculate we're gonna skip that top one for now um, dry with params we did that that worked okay let's do that save it we're making them proper unit tests we'll get rid of that and let's go ahead and um throwing a 
test for like a different like a negative number situation or something and this is sort of arbitrary like I wouldn't just do like this for nothing but it would be anything that you'd want to think of that you'd want to test this against you know so if it's a decimal number like a 5.5 .5, like let's it's not really a good idea to like double them up like this necessarily all the time like I'm doing a negative and a floating point value but um if you were to do one or the other and then both maybe that way you could find out like if it's just one thing is causing the problem okay so let me run that trace back da, 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 da. oh yeah the answer so that's a good failing test and that's more like uh, test driven development you want to write the failing test first but without getting too much into that so on my hand calculator right next to me or on the screen actually I'll just punch it in and make sure I get it right and that's going to be 5.5 .5 negative plus 8 equals 2.5 so that should equal 2.5 I'm going to save it and run it two dots there we go file close so we could also for those dots we could tell it um, and equals if we want and whether or not you consider this dry or not is up to you I mean technically you could make a function called test pass or something like that and it doesn't take any parameters and it will automatically print a dot and take care of all that for you but whatever feels easiest to you don't do any more than that run that and then the dots are on the same line like some of the more traditional tests okay it's enough time on that I think um, testing the calculator for none type I put that in there because this is the actual backend calculator real simple it just has one one function takes one input which is a dictionary with several inputs the operator and two values and it uh, comes through drops down this little pachinko deal and figures out which operator it was and then performs the corresponding operation on it and that's pretty much it but what happens is if it, none of these operators line up then it will come down here and return a none which is kind of like a null and the way we did it the way we structured that is I think the most readable because it's in the else statement so you understand that it comes down and that's the last result another option would be like assign the value none to result up here and then not have that last else clause I don't think that's as readable but anyway um, just to explain what what's going on there and just kinda like put that back in your mind um, no, I forgot what I was talking about I'm trying to blast through so this is the output should return true here so that was one thing in the test is that like we're gonna test this um, that something returns true from output display something that's weird it doesn't return true but it does I guess not returning a value is the same as returning true let's see what happens if we are explicit about it or let's return false and see if that makes the test fail test no so that's bad assert display something returns true hmm that is bizarre I don't know if I'm just, I must not be seeing something totally obvious. Oh, is it going to print? Is it not running the assert statements? It's running the assert statements, right? Because if I change that to like 33, run it, then we get a fail because the assert statement failed. Oh, I hate when this happens and then when I'm done fi filming the video thing I'll go back to it and be like oh there it is in plain sight you know and whatever but I don't 
I get in a different frame of mind when I'm filming because I'm trying to recording or whatever trying to hurry and stuff and have like several things on my mind at once so I can't even see the obvious sometimes okay so this is really horrible I shouldn't even <laughs> I don't believe in leaving a test in this situation but I also don't believe in taking forever so what do I do what's going on test where are we at we're not at test one thing I could do is just highlight those and hit F1 that will take me to the pretty much official Python documentation oh, apparently it doesn't look it up but whatever we just type assert I'm in the second tab over in the index and then we can kind of so that da, da, da. okay anyway tests are passing I don't care right now I'll come back to it and figure it out that is bizarre well something output display something compares to true I have that just feeling in my gut where I want to say dumb, you know, like dumb, what is going on here? It doesn't make any sense. Like assert that that equals true, assert that that equals C. <sighs> Whatever. Okay. I'm just going to close this. I'm over it. Okay. Then we get into here this is the output and I'm like I said before I'm just taking baby steps so some of this seems really dumb but it's to go through the motions and like actually show the reasons why we hop skip and jump and stuff like that instead of just like oh that's what we do you know it's like okay here's the reason we do that you know like here's a tangible reason that happens every time or whatever um, so what's going on here is there's just too many reasons to change. We have the console and we have the the GUI. And if you think about it, a console interface is more likely like a back-end engineering kind of interface. Um, it's not likely to be used by regular users in this day and age. If it is, it is, you know, that's its own special case situation. But I think even these general ideas still apply even in that situation. And that's to just start separating this stuff because it is getting complex it's like when I open this this was one of the files that was like whoa I had to sit there and think about it for a minute it's importing some GUI stuff up here setting a GUI flag to true as opposed to the console so that's basically like making all that code bunk you know just worthless but it's there in memory and uh, instead it's coming down and dealing with some of that and then down here it tests for which one it is so without getting too complex I just like I said with the deprecating stuff by putting it behind a comment I'm just instead of deprecating this I'm gonna just sort of move it and shift things without getting too complex but just make this a little bit more readable for the moment and kinda of like show that things are sliding off here so I'm gonna cut this out and come down below all this and then I'm gonna put a comment down here which is a code smell, right? So, um, so that's good. This code smell is saying, "Hey, you're gonna want to probably like do something with this. You should either, you know, since it's already in a function, it probably needs to go into a console input file." But anyway, for now, that will work. So that's what we did for now and we put it towards the bottom we can get rid of those two and then change the name of this module from input to user input because that inputs kind of vague it's like well what kind of input is that it could be like mouse hamster on a on a wheel input or something for a bad example okay so I'll change that make it a little more readable 
so that's just going to be that same renaming thing where I go file save as and then I'll click on this two times slowly and type user underscore input and then I'll save it as user underscore input dot pi and then say yes I want to overwrite it okay and I'll not hit a five on this one just yet because this one's a module that gets imported it's not really ran the back end's good that's that that doesn't really need much change. I'm not going to leave that as false though. That just looks weird. I'm not even going to put true there since it didn't even matter. And then we'll go to the main and run it. See what's going on here. Do some manual testing. Ooh. Line one import. Oh yeah. Forgot to do that. So on all these files, uh, one option is to go edit, find in files, and then I'm going to do an alt space M to move this down and what I can do is input and then search files and it's going to pop open whatever files that's still in there um, and as you can see it says right click to open locations but it's going to open a new window so if you want to go that route the easiest thing to do is kind of come and close all these other windows out and then as you right click go to file line then it will open a new window and even if there's multiple changes in one window if it opens that window it will just be that one window but um yeah that's one option or you could just change it here well that's one option anyway another option is to just say okay I need to change it in these files and then uh close this window out and then just change it in those files and we close this one so that one looks good whoa where'd everything go so edit find in files input so in calc main and test calc File, recent, calc main. Right, we're going to change that to user input and save it. And then the other one is test calc. User input. Okay, I'm going to run this test again, make sure it still works. Looking good. And then we can close that window and then do a find and files again. And it should not turn up any results. So there's one result. User input. And we'll just do that one more time. Edit, find and files. no hits that's what we're talking about okay so let's run this and it's working cool negative five minus negative fifty five point five alright so what would that be that would be a plus then a minus again yeah control C alt F4 all right, let's see where we're at. Main's looking good, and as we can see, everything comes back through main. Uh, through main, it weaves back, kind of like a sewing needle with thread. It comes, you know, makes this call to get input, and then it comes back through that hole with the thread and stores it in input, and then it comes through. You know, it doesn't get result yet. It's right to left, so it's like this more, I guess, and then. It just it's weaving those answers so all the answers are traveling through this main which is fine but there may be if there's certain architectural situ situations that you need to do to handle not just for convention not just arbitrarily because of some BS upfront design or something but because you know for a real reason 
for like a real tangible explainable documentable reason um, you may want you know like your calculator module even though it might not output to the screen you might be able to still send it like an output object that it can call some function some method on that object that says like hey you know it can just basically you can just pass it like your output object and just provide some common interface it's a little bit advanced if you're a beginner but that's just something to keep in mind so anyway I might not go much further than that let me see for now I really wanted to so the main one's good the GUI is pretty good so what did I not cover the test so what you can see here is this is this is the output module and it's eventually going to be split into two files and what this file will become is it will become basically something to this effect of like just interface it's just going to be like a shim to decide just as sort of like a common element you know like if you almost just like I'm trying to think of a good analogy but it's just fulfilling what they call a contract and if you look in certain types of development there's like this strict quote unquote contract I'm using it in a little bit looser terms than that um, but it's just basically like we want to be able to provide whatever physical like whatever one of those singleton module files like we want to be able to potentially provide like a hundred of those right ones that we can't even think of now um, but all we need to do really is pit this in between as sort of like an interface like our thing can talk to this file um, there's a zillion different ways to handle this or realistically there's several different ways to consider handling this but that just seems the simplest way to wrap about for now but yeah I'll just leave it at that for now that's a little bit less than I'd like to get done but hey that was productive and the next time we revisit this code it will be even that much cleaner thanks a lot for watching